The Allen River watershed is a small watershed that lies in Northumberland County in northeast England. The watershed contains the city of Annick, which is home to Annick Castle, the ancestral home of the Percy family, which holds the title of the Duke of Northumberland. The castle is also famous for serving as the location of several movies, including the early Harry Potter movies. While the Allen River is a smaller watershed, it has had a significant impact on British and cinema history. It is also a nice example of a small coastal watershed that one can find along the coasts of many continents. Modern watersheds act in two ways. They serve to shape the people who live, work, and play within them, and the people serve to shape the watershed. Therefore, the human system and the river system serves to shape each other. Let's start with the roadmap for where I'm going to take you during this presentation. We will start by looking at the River Allen watershed and how it was formed through the actions of fire, ice, and erosion. We will then transition into learning about the people of the River Allen and how they have influenced the development of the watershed. Finally, we will talk about the condition of the river today. So let's get started by looking at the watershed. Unlike big watersheds like the Amazon, the Nile, or the Mississippi River, the River Allen is not one that quickly comes to mind when we think of the world's rivers. So where is the river, and what is the land through which it flows like? The River Allen lies within the United Kingdom. As I stated in our introduction, the watershed lies within Northumberland County, which is the far northeastern county of England, with Scotland lying across the border to the north and the North Sea to the east. This is Northumberland County to give you the geographical context. In the east central portion of the county is the city of Annick, which will be an important reference point as we move forward with our exploration of the Allen River watershed. Physical geography plays an important role in shaping watersheds. In Northumberland County, the physical geography ranges from mountainous terrain in the northwest to the North Sea in the east. The county lies in the northern latitude, which means it has a generally cool climate, and because it lies on the east coast of England, it generally has less rainfall than much of the western part of the country. In the western part of the county are the Cheviot Hills. There is a mid-region of forests and moors, and a coastal plain along the North Sea. Much of the landscape of the county was shaped by two geologic events. First, there was fire. Volcanoes created mountainous cones throughout the northern part of the county. These volcanoes were reshaped by periodic glacial events that eroded the volcanic cones and shaped glacial valleys that carved channels throughout the landscape and deposited glacial material in the lower areas of the county. This is one of the rolling valleys that show the eroded volcanic cones with glacially carved valleys that frequently serve as the corridors for rivers within the region. In areas that were less influenced by volcanic activity, the landscape was shaped by erosion, where sand and other material was moved from higher areas to lower areas through the process of erosion and sedimentation over geologic periods. In addition, the land was molded through the actions of plate tectonics that bent, twisted, and mashed the landscape. The underground environment is just as fascinating as the surface, and has shaped how people have used the landscape. Within Northumberland County, there are deposits of coal and lead. These ancient deposits give a glimpse of the life and actions of the landscape in the distant past. These prehistoric materials have had great value to humans, both living in the landscape and those far from it, as these materials have been mined over time, leading to significant impacts to the environment and to the people living within the watershed, the larger county, and Greater England. The Cheviot Hills in the northwestern part of the county are where one can find the visual remnants of the volcanic and glacial activity. These rolling hills were created by volcanic activity and smoothed by the glacial forces of ice and water. In the last several thousand years, humans have also had a significant hand in shaping this landscape. Covering the volcanic hills and glacial valleys are areas of heath, bog, and grassland interspersed with forests. This region generally supports high-quality rivers. For those unfamiliar with the previously mentioned plant communities, heath is a low-growing evergreen shrub. 
These heath areas are signs of long-term human influence on the landscape, as heath areas tend to be maintained by regular livestock grazing. Without regular grazing, these areas tend to grow into forests. Bogs are a kind of wetland, or a saturated area. Bogs are acidic, which retards the decomposition of the dead vegetation, which can result in the development of peat. These bog areas are important for both helping to clean water flowing through the landscape and for storing water during periods of heavy rainfall. Here is a piece of trivia you can use as you're polishing off a pint with your mates. Who lives in bogs? Well, bog bodies live in bogs. A bog body is the preserved corpse of a person who fell or was placed into a bog a long time ago. Because of the acidic nature of the bog, decomposition happens very slowly. Without decomposition, these bodies are preserved in near perfect condition for centuries. If you happen to be a bog body, what would you eat? Well, of course, you would eat bog butter. Bog butter, like bog bodies, were containers of butter placed into bogs many years ago that have been preserved by the acidic nature of the bogs. Now, I am not sure if we would enjoy bog butter, but it is a highly prized delicacy among bog bodies. Or maybe not. Bog bodies tend to be quiet about their dietary preferences. Earlier, I discussed how heath, if left alone, will grow into forests. This region of Northumberland used to have a lot more forests. However, through human activity related to plant and animal agriculture, we have lost much of these historic forests. However, there are still many hectares of traditional forests. There are also many forest plantations in the region. Let's talk about those forest plantations. In some of the lesser productive areas and abandoned lands, people have planted conifer plantations that serve as wildlife habitat and can be used for wood production down the road. In addition, there is a large effort to plant trees to sequester carbon and to establish landscape vegetation that is resilient to climate change. When you visit the Allen River watershed, look at these tree plants to see how the vision and needs of today shape the future. In this region, we also find peat. So what is peat? Well, as in the discussion of bogs, peat can be found in acidic wetlands where, as the surface material dies, it does not rot and becomes preserved, forming mats of peat. These areas of peat can grow several meters thick and are used for a variety of purposes, such as home heating and the flavoring of some kinds of whiskey. Moving closer to the North Sea, we transition into the coastal plain. These inland areas are gently rolling landscapes that are dominated by farm fields. Some of these fields are thousands of years old and support both livestock grazing and crop production. As one drives along local roads, cows and sheep can be seen grazing on pastures, while wheat, oat, barley, and flax are the dominant crops planted in the farmed areas. We also see woodlands lying adjacent to rivers and occurring in woodlots in the larger states. Northumberland County and the River Allen flow into the North Sea. This coastline varies from dramatic cliffs rising from the ocean to broad beaches with dunes and mudflats. This transitional area between land and ocean is an excellent example of where a river meets its endpoints by joining with the sea. Here are the different watersheds within Northumberland County. From north to south, we have the North Burns Watershed, which is primarily short rivers that flow directly to the sea. We then have the Allen River watershed that flows through Annick and Elmouth before entering the North Sea. The Coquet watershed is the largest in the county. Finally, the Lynn and Wandsbeck watershed and the Blythe and Seton Burn watersheds cover the southern part of the county. Depending on where we live, we may use different words for the same idea. In the U.S., we generally use the term watershed. In the United Kingdom, you will often see the word catchment. Both terms reference the same idea. I will be using the term watershed because that is the one I was taught to use. A few slides ago, I presented a slide that showed all the watersheds in Northumberland County. Let's get into a smaller scale. The River Allen has a watershed that drains much of north central Northumberland County shown here in the green box. This is a close-up view of the River Allen watershed. You can see that it flows from the western hills and has several small tributaries that flow into the main river before it enters the tidal region and eventually drains into the North Sea. 
On this image, you can see the city of Anak, which is a major tourist attraction that draws many people to the region. Anak Castle was the primary reason my wife and I visited the area. Seeing the river next to the castle sparked my interest in the hydrology of the region, which is why you are seeing this presentation. To get into an even finer scale, this is the Anak sub-watershed. All the water that falls in this section of land in the dark blue will drain to this section of the river. Rain falling outside of this dark blue line will flow to either another portion of the Allen watershed or to a different watershed entirely. And here is an image of the Castle Anak, with the River Allen flowing to the north. The water from the castle and the pasture across the river flow into the Allen River. Now there is one small thing to consider about the castle. If you look around the inside perimeter of the castle, you will see drainage pipes. These pipes actually alter the natural flow of water in this tiny sub-watershed. Rather than flowing over the surface, these pipes drain water underground to the river. If you do the pasture walk on the north side of the river, you can see one of the drainage pipes that redirects water from the surface into the underground pipes and eventually to the river. We will talk about what this does to water quality and quantity later in this presentation. In summary, the water that flows through the River Allen watershed flows from the Cheviot Hills down through a variety of landscapes before eventually entering the tidal flats that finally drain into the North Sea. Different kinds of hominid remains have shown that our genetic ancestors have come and gone from Great Britain for hundreds of thousands of years. However, the humans that we are going to be concerned about in the modern Allen River watershed arrive between 5000 and 3000 BC. We do not have modern visitor logs, so we cannot pin down a specific date, but this is a generally accepted range of arrival. As modern humans moved into the watershed, they were effectively functioning as a new animal in the landscape. Small bands of hunter-gatherers would travel throughout the landscape, killing and eating animals, and enjoying the fruits and vegetables that could be foraged. While they did modify the landscape, and probably caused local extinctions and other minor environmental changes, they did not cause wholesale modification to the landscape. That changed, and changed quickly, once people learned how to domesticate and grow seeds in a conscious and deliberate fashion. When people started farming the landscape, there were rapid and significant changes to the environment. Many of these changes are still with us today. As people began to settle in one place to plant and harvest crops, land ownership began to be a thing, and we had to learn to defend our property against others, which saw the development of defensive systems to protect against raids and to serve as points from which to launch raids against neighboring groups. This image shows some of the changes that resulted from people settling into the landscape as farmers. We have a crop field in which domesticated plants are grown for later harvest. We have livestock being moved across the landscape. Not just any animal, but specific species that were easy to control. In addition to the direct farming activities, we also see changes to the landscape from people living in one place for a long time. We have a lived area that is compacted soil and permanent homes. Permanent settlement leads to concentrated areas of human waste. Overall, there are just a lot of things that are changing from the landscape before humans began farming it. How did farming specifically change the Allen watershed? First, we chose and introduced plant species that provided us with food or fiber at significant quantities. We also focused on raising preferred animal species and worked to eliminate those species that ate our preferred species. Finally, in order to see better outcomes from our plants and animals, and to delineate our farms from someone else, we implemented specific management strategies. When we look at what farming did to our ecosystem, one of the largest impacts was the change in species. In a native ecosystem, we generally have a high level of species diversity, with plants and animals adapted to the specific landscape. We also see more perennial plants that live for many years. In a farmed system, we will have min minimal diversity, if not a monoculture. We want our plants to do well and not compete with the native species which are now seen as weeds. In addition, our preferred species will often require some kind of management that will change the ecosystem. For example, rather than being able to grow in a species-rich environment, our preferred species may need tillage to reduce competition and be more productive. Most of our agricultural crops are also annuals and need to be planted once a year. 
As you can see from this comparison, the changes humans made to farm the landscape resulted in substantial changes to the way the ecosystem functions. Here is an example of the difference in rooting structure between a native perennial and an annual farmed crop. The native perennial will live for many years and put down a deep root system, allowing the plant to exist through periods of drought. The annual farmed crop has a short root system because it just needs to live for one season, and we want the growth to go to the crop, and not the root. How do you think these two rooting strategies might influence soil dynamics? Once people began to break up the native vegetation that covered the rich soils in Northumberland, we forever changed the landscape. When we look at actions that occurred more than 2,000 years ago, we can still see the remnants of those activities in the landscape, and how those changes have altered the functioning of the soil with a larger impact on the greater ecosystem continuing to this day. As an example, here is a picture of cultivation that was initiated prior to Roman arrival. While it is difficult to know when the site was officially abandoned, we can still see the ridges on the landscape. Imagine when it rains on this site. How do you think the water is going to run off the landscape? The rows running down the landscape create channels that are likely to direct water more quickly through the landscape rather than slowly percolating into the soil. In addition to reshaping the soil surface for crop production, historic farming changes the very structure of the soil. All natural soils have tiny pores that allow for infiltration and water movement. Tillage breaks up these pores and changes the dynamics of infiltration and movement of water through the soil. Repeated tillage can also weaken the soil structure and make sites more susceptible to erosion. While agriculture changed the micro-level scale of the soil and altered the landscape at the field level, early farmers also quickly learned that their practices were not particularly sustainable on the slopes within Northumberland. To reduce erosion and create field areas that were easier to plant and harvest and to conserve water, they terraced the land, which involved building benches on the sloped hillsides. These benches were easier to farm, but also changed the way the water flowed across the landscape. These ancient terraces can still be seen on the landscape. The persistence of these terraces over 2,000 years indicates the ability of historic farmers to construct long-term projects and to maintain them over hundreds of years. Beyond the planting of crops, the raising of livestock also changed the landscape. When ancient farmers moved from hunting the deer and other game of forest and field to raising their own animals, several things happened to the landscape. Just like people, livestock have preferences for what they eat. Therefore, over time, the vegetative complexity of the landscape tends to decline as livestock selectively graze specific plants. In addition, concentrating animals in smaller areas rather than letting them roam across the landscape tends to compact the soil, reducing infiltration rates. Livestock need access to water, and in their pursuit of water, will often trample stream banks, weakening the structure of the bank and resulting in increased erosion, particularly in high use areas. Finally, we need to remember that when animals eat, they digest the food and send it out their back end. This manure can serve to fertilize the landscape, but can also create water quality problems as higher rates of manure enter the water carrying microbes and other nasties that cause human illness. Here is a pasture along the Allen. Before humans started farming and grazing their animals on this landscape, it was likely a dense riparian forest. Now it is a grazed meadow with minimal tree cover and a stream bank that is potentially subject to higher rates of erosion during flood events. In addition, the rain that falls on this landscape likely enters the river more quickly, increasing downstream flow rates. And finally, if one were to wander through this pasture, you would probably find manure piles from the sheep. While these manure piles fertilize the land over the long term, during heavy rains, any microbes in the piles will flow into the river. So while farming and livestock production allowed more people to live on the landscape, these practices significantly alter the landscape, including the river Allen itself. As people settled across the landscape, their claims to specific parcels became more important. When one planted crops, one wanted to make sure that you could harvest them in the future. Therefore, protection of the land and the people from invaders became important. As part of the need for defense, forts were built. 
While forts had a small footprint on the landscape, they had an outsized influence on the locations in which they were placed. The very structure of a fort created significant disturbance to the landscape. The movement and placement of rock altered water flows and reduced infiltration. Water has a very difficult time flowing through the rocky floor of a fort. Therefore, there is significant runoff from the impervious surface. Forts were also notoriously unproductive. Farming within the fort walls was not done, so all food needed to be brought into the fort. This meant that forts attracted farmers who could sell their food to the soldiers. In addition, there were other merchants and artisans who lived in proximity to the forts to provide the needed goods and services. Finally, forts being concentrated areas of human habitation needed to get rid of the human waste. Without modern septic systems, you can imagine how human waste was moved off the fort proper. When the Romans came to Northumberland, they came in legions of around 5,000 men. These men needed food in significant quantities to live, let alone fight. They did not order up Amazon to ship food from Rome, but purchased or taxed the food from local inhabitants. In addition to providing for their own needs, the local community needed to plant enough crops and raise enough livestock to feed an additional 5,000 people for 365 days a year. This must have resulted in a massive operation on a level that is almost unimaginable for an Iron Age farmer and his family, or even his community. There must have been tremendous changes to the landscape to create the farms, fields, and pastures to meet these needs. After having eaten their fill from food produced locally, these Roman legions had to get rid of their waste. While they did have a well-developed sewage system for moving waste from their encampments, where did this waste go after it left the camp? Remember, we are not talking about modern sewage systems that go to a modern sewage treatment plant. Rather, this waste was moved into the rivers and streams, where it was carried downstream. Waste out of sight is waste out of mind. That is, out of mind, unless you live downstream of the encampment. Following the Roman period, as the legions withdrew, the farming landscape did not need to support as many people. However, while active farming areas shrunk, those areas that had been converted to fields and abandoned still retained the history of agricultural production. The soil, while recovering from annual planting, was extensively modified. The nutrient dynamics within the region was altered with a shift of species and the loss of forests. And the reshaping of the landscape through roads, forts, sewage canals, and other drainage systems altered both surface and groundwater flows. Having looked at how agricultural production and military defense changed the landscape, let's switch our focus and look at how mining and manufacturing altered the River Allen watershed. As we introduced at the beginning of this presentation, there are quite a few valuable underground resources including coal, granite, and lead. The mining of these materials resulted in direct and indirect impacts to the watershed. Within fairly close proximity to Anak, we can find several coal mining sites. These mines are now abandoned, but during their day, they supplied coal for heating and industrial production throughout the region. Prior to mining, the coal seams were undisturbed, and water flowed through them as it would through other subsurface deposits. However, as you can see from this image of coal miners digging for coal underground, this activity had unpredictable influence on groundwater flow. Now water could follow through the mined areas freely, rather than having to flow through the pores within the coal seam. This meant there was more rapid groundwater flow through the system. Many mines also required a drainage system to prevent the groundwater from flooding the active mine shafts. While subsurface mining influenced groundwater flow, there are techniques of above-ground mining that saw even more substantial changes within the watershed. When people were mining for lead, they would dam water above a suspected seam and then release the water to wash away the vegetation and topsoil, which exposed the seam underneath. As you can imagine, this had massive impact where the hushing occurred, but also downstream. In the long term, these hushing sites slightly created long-term instability in the landscapes, with greater erosion leading to additional sediment entering streams and river channels. Following the removal of the lead from the ground, it had to be prepared for use, which resulted in waste piles or tailings. Before people thought about water quality, these tailing piles were located near the plants. 
Unfortunately, many of them were also located near rivers and streams. As the rivers and streams meandered through the landscape, these migrating channels came even closer to the tailing piles. With the toxic metals found in these piles, should the river channel start to cut into the tailings pile, it will create an unacceptable impact to water quality. Flowing water is a direct energy source unto itself. Water mills directly harvested the energy from water moving downhill. There were and are a variety of industries within the Allen River watershed that use the river for power, including a variety of mills. Here are five mills within the watershed and the industry they support. While mills add a pleasing rustic feel on the landscape, they do change the watershed by creating dams and runs to direct the water that moves the wheel. Depending upon the height of the dams and the speed of the runs, fish can be blocked from moving through the channel. In addition, these dams can influence water quantity, particularly during high and low flows. Beyond agriculture, defense, and industry, the growth of cities within the Allen River watershed have also changed the landscape, with the resulting changes to the river. This is an image of Anik. While this broad view gives a good feel for the city, let's zoom in a bit and look at a smaller scale to see how the city changes the landscape. Here is a view of Anik Castle and the surrounding area. As you can see, there is some greenery, but there is also a lot of pavement. So what happens when it rains in Anik? with all the concrete and the reduced ability to infiltrate water into the soil. The water flows rapidly along the streets and sidewalks until it reaches the storm sewers. The storm sewers carry this water to the river faster than the river was adapted to, and we see higher flow rates downstream of cities. Unfortunately, Anik, like many other cities, is finding that increasing heavy rainfalls that occur in a short period of time are causing flash floods. Rather than find natural channels or infiltrating into the soil, the water sits and gathers, causing tremendous difficulty for those who live in the region. We've spent a lot of time talking about the geography of the Allen River watershed. Let's dive into the quality and quantity of the water within the watershed. Water quality focuses on factors such as the chemistry and biology found within different parts of the system. So what does the water quality in the Allen River watershed look like? The British Department of Environment, Food, and Rural Affairs, also known as DEFRA, has collected data for the River Allen and produced a comprehensive report that analyzes the sub-watersheds within the larger system. As you can see, we have water bodies that are poor, many that are moderate, and a few that are good. In this summary, a water body is a larger portion of the watershed. Water body elements are smaller segments of a stream. Let's break down what these numbers mean in a little bit more detail. These are the definitions of the different classifications of ecological water conditions. They range from high to bad. When DEFRA is looking at ecological water conditions, it is an all-or-nothing system. For a water body to be good, all conditions have to be good. If any of the bodies fall below good, then the body is not classified as good. Here is the ecological status for the different sub-watersheds within the River Allen watershed. There are 10 sub-watersheds, of which three are rated as good. However, as you can see, we also have five that are moderate and two that are poor. Therefore, the watershed overall is not classified as good. Here is the chemical status for the surface waters within the watershed. Chemical status is either good or fail, depending upon if the system exceeds acceptable measurement standards for a variety of persistent chemicals. If the system has one chemical that exceeds standards, the sub-watershed is classified as failing. In this case, all the sub-watersheds have at least one persistent chemical that is in excess of standards, which is why they are all classed as failing. Again, this is the Allen River watershed. Within this watershed, there are 10 identified sub-watersheds. These are the 10 listed sub-watersheds. Remember, when we are looking at the sub-watersheds within a larger watershed, the sub-watersheds are nested within the larger watershed, and in this case, drain sequentially down to the ocean interface. We are not going to look at all 10 watersheds in terms of water quality, because that would take a while. If you are interested in learning about any, or all of the 10 sub-watersheds, 
This hyperlink will bring you to the DEFRA website, from which you can select from the previous list and find the information specific to that subwatershed. For now, we are going to look at one of the headwater subwatersheds to see how the river looks at its source. We are then going to look at the outlet of the watershed to see how the water quality changes as it flows through the different landscapes before it enters the tidal region and the North Sea. We are going to start our water quality analysis from one of the sources of the River Allen, here. This subwatershed runs from the headwaters to where it joins with another subwatershed at the Cali Burn, right here. At this point, we enter a lower subwatershed that was assessed as a different unit within the larger watershed. By looking at these smaller subwatersheds, we can get a better idea for where pollutants are occurring so that we can better target corrective activities. Here is a close up view of this headwater subwatershed. Remember, when we were talking about a watershed, all the rain that falls within this subwatershed flows along the land surface to the same common endpoint at Cali Burn. This is a breakdown of the different assessed elements that contributed to our assessment of the ecological quality of the river. As you can see, the majority of this portion of the headwaters is listed as being in good or high condition. That is why in 2013, this subwatershed is listed as being in good condition. However, in 2014, there is a change, an addition, in what was monitored for this subwatershed. We added the category of macrophytes and phytobenthos combined. Within this section of the Allen River, the category of microphytes and phytobenthos was rated as moderate, which pulled down the overall ecological condition of the river. Well, so, what are macrophyte, macrophytes and phytobenthos, and why are they so important? Macrophytes and phytobenthos are the vegetative component of the food chain. While the insects, bugs, and fish were in good condition, the aquatic plants were not appropriate for this particular stretch of the river. There might have been species that were missing, or species that were in higher or lower abundance than what should have been there, or maybe even things that were not supposed to be there to begin with. Why are macrophytes so important to the system that we decided to monitor for them? Because macrophytes are the foundation of the food web. The macrophytes are what the invertebrates eat, and the fish eat the invertebrates. A poor assemblage of macrophytes and phytobenthos can result in a loss of higher organisms on the food chain. A further assessment of the reason for the moderate rating was poor nutrient management, or an overapplication of manure and fertilizer to rural lands. Specifically, there are higher levels of phosphate entering the water than one would expect in an undisturbed system. When we have more phosphate in the water, it tends to lead to a specific kind of biological reaction. One of the challenges that higher levels of phosphate can cause are increases in algae production. This is not a picture of the Allen River with algae, but it does show what can happen when phosphate gets too high. We see more algae growth. And then, as the algae die, their decomposition removes oxygen from the water, which can kill organisms higher on the food web. So while not all algae is bad, too much algae can cause real problems. The moderate rating was based upon poor nutrient management in the headwaters, and that's a warning light. While conditions are not bad, they could get worse without proper management of the upstream activities. Our ecological condition is moderate because of high phosphorus levels leading to a concern about the water-based plant community. So what about the chemistry within the subwatershed? How is that doing? Within the Allen River, we find higher than acceptable levels of mercury and PBDEs. There are not direct contributors of these chemicals to the river, but they come from diffuse sources such as the burning of coal or the production of certain products. Therefore, because these two chemicals cause severe health impairments and they are widespread throughout the landscape in England and much of the world, they will typically trigger a failure rating for chemical conditions. Managing these chemicals at their source is the best way to remove them from the system, and this would require a national and international response, rather than something people living within the watershed can do on their own. Now let's move to the lowest sub-watershed within the Allen watershed. This is the watershed to which all the upper watersheds drain and will collect all the pollutants and chemicals that flow from the upland areas. This stub watershed starts at the Eddingham Burn, where several upstream watersheds join together. 
The sub-watershed collects the water from the upstream and upland areas, and then drains into the tidal region before outloading to the North Sea. This is a close-up view of this particular sub-watershed. As we are looking at the sub-watershed, there is one smaller sub-watershed that enters near the outlet. This is the College Burn that drains this sub-watershed and is a tributary of the lower portion of the River Allen. In comparison to the Headwaters region, as we get to the outlet area of the River Allen, we see the water quality is quite a bit worse. If you think about it, this is not really a big surprise. As the water flows downstream, it collects all the contaminants from the upper sub-watersheds. All of these contaminants accumulate at the mouth, where we can see the totality of what is being contributed to the watershed overall. If we look at the sources of these contaminants, we see a bit of a change. While we still have nutrient management problems from agricultural uses, we see more contaminants from in-stream sources which occur when things like bank erosion happens. We also see river misconnections which occur through the installation of dams and other obstructions that can present fish passage. And as we see more human habitation, sewage discharge is also becoming a bit of a concern. While we do have some more problem areas in terms of water quality, there is one thing that is really important to call out. What do you see happening between 2014 and 2019? The water quality has moved from poor to moderate. People are taking action to reduce the addition of new pollutants to the river and doing things to eliminate current sources of pollution. The water quality is getting better. With continued efforts, we can continue to see additional improvements over time. Maybe we can even get the river to good condition in another decade. In terms of chemical pollutants, we still see mercury in PBDEs. It doesn't just disappear as the water flows, so we continue to see this being a problem. Let's move from the quality of the water in the Allen River to the quantity. Recently, the Allen River has seen both periods of drought and flooding that have created challenges to those living within the watershed. What is causing some of these problems? Let's start with the global changes that maybe influence the water quantity within the river. In the Allen River region, depending upon the percent degree rise in temperature, we may see minimal change to the number of rainy days to a reduction by two rainy days during the summer. So if we get fewer rainy days, depending upon the amount of precipitation during rainfall events, we can expect less summer water in the system, which may lead to more droughty conditions. As we spoke about in the last slide, while we may see less rainy days, depending upon the degree rise, we may see more rain during each rain event. This means that while we may have less rain events, when they do happen, they may be more intense, which can result in flash flooding. The combination of heat and heavy downpours is a cause for concern. While we can predict with reasonable certainty the long-term and systemic changes that are likely to occur, we have yet to develop the tools that will allow us to predict individual events with any certainty. Outside of the large-scale global changes, we are also seeing changes on the landscape that are changing the quantity of water flowing through the system. Within the rural and agricultural areas of the system, we are seeing farmers moving water off their fields more quickly to assist with crop production. One way that farmers are moving water off their fields is subsurface drainage. Subsurface drainage involves installing tubes, or tiles, under the soil surface to speed the movement of water through the soil. These tubes act as sinks under the soil to draw water from the surrounding area and increase the rate of flow through the soil to an outlet point, often a creek or a river. This drainage happens at the field scale, and as these fields drain faster than undrained fields, we see more water added to the streams in a shorter period of time. Therefore, the water, as it moves downstream, increases the volume within the channel, which can result in more downstream flooding. Agricultural areas are not the only ones that are seeing increased movement of water. Our increasing urbanized environment is also changing the quantity of water that enters the river channels. This is just a small part of ANIC. As you can see from this picture, we have housing developments, roads, and commercial areas. These areas have a lot of hard surfaces that prevent water from infiltrating into the soil. Now, when water hits the hard surface, it is directed to a storm sewer, which then rapidly dumps it into the river, where it joins with all the water coming from upstream 
and can again result in localized flooding. This overhead image of the Anna Castle shows what appears to be a lot of green that one would think would allow for more infiltration. If you visit Anna Castle, and I strongly encourage you to do so, stroll over some of the grassy portions inside the castle. You will find that the grass feels hard underneath. If you happen to visit during a rainy day, you will notice that the water is flowing off the grass rather than infiltrating in. Therefore, the look of this area is a little deceptive in terms of water quantity. The green would seem to indicate the ability to infiltrate into the ground, but in reality, these grassy areas are little better than the adjacent pavement. Let's do a quick recap of how water flows through a watershed. Water that falls onto the river itself will move through the system quickly. When it falls on the land surface, depending upon the vegetation on the surface and the slope of the site, it will move at a medium to fast speed until it reaches the stream channel, where it once again begins to move quickly. When the water hits the soil surface, some of it will infiltrate into the soil. As it infiltrates into the soil, depending upon the kind of soil, if it is sandy, it will move at a medium speed to the channel through large pores, while clay soils, which have smaller pores, will see slower water movement. Finally, if the water infiltrates into the soil and flows downward into the groundwater, the movement speed tends to slow to a crawl and may take centuries to move to the river channel or another outlet. When we see actions like agricultural drainage or urbanization, we will see changes in the water flow regime. When the rain hits the water in the channel, the speed will continue to be fast. One interesting feature is that as the river channel changes to adapt to increasing flow rates, it may widen, which allows it to handle more water flow. This means that a fast rate may become even faster as the more water is able to move through the channel in any given amount of time. If water hits a field where vegetation has been removed or falls on pavement, the overland flow will be faster than normal. In agricultural areas, for water that does infiltrate into the soil, if that soil is drained, we will see the water moving through the soil faster in the drain tiles than we would expect given the natural soil conditions. Finally, groundwater flows will largely be unaffected by human development. Let's see how changing climate and land use changes can influence the water quantity within the Allen River. Due to changes in the climate, we are likely to have fewer but heavier rain events. If we add more intense rainfall events on top of reduced infiltration from hard landscapes and increased soil drainage that moves water through the soil more quickly, we are probably going to see more flooding, particularly flash flooding as more rain overloads stormwater systems that were not designed to handle such heavy amounts of water. So where does the River Allen stand overall? In terms of the landscape, while it has a history of volcanic activity and hundreds of thousands of years of sedimentation, due to the glacial history, the current landscape is fairly young. With the glaciers having receded a little over 13,000 years ago, the landscape is still forming and finding its way to equilibrium. The region has a long history of human occupation. It did not take long for hunter-gatherers to follow the melting ice and move into the region. Once humans enter the region, they began to engage with the landscape and change it in both intentional and unintentional ways. As technology improved, humans began to further change the system. Farming and mining saw land changes that influenced the water regime. In addition, damming and the management of stormwater in urbanized environments directly influenced the way water moved through the system. These changes also saw increased levels of pollutants that have changed the quality of the water for the humans who rely on it for drinking, bathing, and many other uses. While our ancestors changed the landscape for thousands of years, we are still making decisions today that will change the landscape, including the quantity and quality of water within the rivers and streams. As we make these changes to the environment, the environment will change those who live within it. Flooding and poor water quality influence the decisions of the people, including where they live and how they work. This feedback loop will continue to change the river, while changes to the river will change the people living within the watershed. 
while human activity has seen changes in water quantity and quality, the people who live within the watershed are becoming more aware of their impact and taking actions to improve the river and the larger watershed. Overall, while we are seeing challenges in terms of water quantity, the water quality is generally getting better. If you are visiting the northeast coast of Great Britain and have the time to visit the city of Annick, or maybe come up to do a little fishing or hiking, I encourage you to visit the Allen River. It is a beautiful region with a fascinating river. It's a gem within the larger British landscape. If you do visit, I hope you enjoy it as much as my wife and I did.